How's it going guys? So I want to take some time today to answer some common questions that I've had about our robot feeding system that we started up just a few weeks ago. So this is a Lily Vector robotic feeding system that we have floating forages out of the silos and then we have grain bins outside with those flex augers. We have two mixing feeding robots. This one's loading a batch right now. The other one is driving up that direction towards the freestyle barn with a batch of feed. Now that we're past three weeks running with the system, feeling a little bit more confident. We've gotten a few bugs worked out. The number one asked question that I've had is how are these robots going to handle the winter weather using these outdoor pads? We're located in southern Pennsylvania. We do get some snow, some cold weather, ice. And it's not as bad as it is if you go a few hours north of us, but it's definitely something to think about. There's two of these Lely Vector systems running in our county. Both of them go outside like ours does and they seem to be able to make them work just fine. The units themselves have a lot of weight, so they actually can push some snow. You can change the settings so that the skirt drops down when it's driving outside here, and it can clear a path. Now, the only issue is it's not gonna clean every bit of that snow off the surface, and it'll turn into a layer of ice pretty soon, I think. So we're gonna have to spread some calcium chloride or some sort of de-icer on the paths just to keep the ice from building up. If we know we have a real heavy snowstorm coming, we're gonna probably let them feed ahead, get plenty of feed in the troughs, and then shut them off until after the storm's over. That way we're not having to keep the paths cleaned off constantly. It's gonna be a learning process. If we get some big snowstorms this winter, it might be a pain, but I think we'll learn how to manage it after a, a couple storms. Most winters we will get a snowstorm. Uh, it's not always too much snow. Last winter we had one that was maybe six inches. There was a lot of drifting with that storm, so that would probably be sort of a pain you got a lot of snow blowing across and re-covering the path. We had considered running water tubes through the concrete just right at the uh, wheel tracks. Thought we could maybe melt that ice, but it would have added a good amount of cost and we just weren't sure if it was gonna actually be worth it. We think we'll be able to make it work. I know when we have some snow, we're gonna have to spend some time out here making sure they can run, but we're not gonna have to worry about feeding the cows that day, so we should have time to clear paths. It won't be that big a deal. As far as the vectors go, they are made to be outdoors. They uh, aren't bothered by water or anything like that. They can handle the elements. Rain won't be a problem for them. We'll get a little bit of water inside the mix while it's driving outside, but that's not gonna be enough to make any issues at all. It's nothing like we used to have when we mixed the feed outside. The bunker silos, they would take on a lot of rain and the feed would get a lot heavier. So it would throw off our mix. We had to add extra pounds to counter the weight of the water. The nice thing with this setup, when we get rain, all the forages are in the silos, they're not gonna be changing. Everything's getting mixed inside, so the batch is gonna be mixed accurately. It's just a matter of a little bit of water getting added to it while it's traveling up. The biggest issue I think we are gonna have is the way we set this path up. I wish we had done it a little bit differently. We should have kept this a bit higher because the way it works out right now, all the water out of the bunkers drains this way and actually comes across the pathway and then works down to the left there. We're gonna have to do something about that. Probably gonna just put some sort of buffer right along here for now, just to force that water off this side. If we wanted to, we could put a drain in somewhere there and actually pipe it out that direction. Another question that was asked is, do the mixers measure by weight or they go off timers for all the ingredients? It does have a scale on it. Everything's based off of weight. Right now we got corn running in there. It'll actually learn how much of an ingredient will come after it sends the signal to stop it. The main thing that's nice for is out of the silos. When it tells one of the silo loaders to turn off, it takes about 10 seconds for the feed to actually stop coming out of the unloader, stop falling down the silo. So the conveyor has to run 10 extra seconds. The system should do a pretty good job at predicting how much feed will still come after it sends that signal to shut it off. The vector system, the main brain is in this red box. All of this equipment right here is built by a local company and this controls all the silo unloaders and the conveyors. This will get a signal from the main Lely box. So this main box will tell these silo unloader boxes to start their shutdown process, which there's a couple steps to that. And then eventually it'll turn the conveyor off. We will be able to get mixed accuracy data. That's not coming through on the computer yet. I guess it takes a little bit of time for that to start working. It's gonna be really interesting to see what the percent accuracy is on some of these ingredients. And we're hoping to be well above 90% accuracy on the forages. The grain ingredients should be even better. Another question that kind of goes along with that is, why did we run three separate conveyors from each silo 
instead of just having one long one outside. It's kind of a complicated setup up there, a lot going on above the mixer. In some ways it would have been simpler if we had all these silo chutes directly towards the building. We could have ran one long conveyor that would go under all three silos and then just have one single conveyor going up through into the mixer. It would have been simpler as far as putting less holes in the wall of the building, but there's a couple advantages with this setup. So for one thing, we don't have to get these conveyors empty between ingredients. So right now those conveyors have some forge still sitting in them. And that just helps increase the accuracy of the system because it's decreasing that amount of time that the ingredient has to run after the robot sends a signal to turn an ingredient off. So it's about 10 seconds the way we're set up now. Now if we had one long conveyor that all the silos fed into, it might be 30 seconds of feed that would have to fall after it tells it to turn an unloader off because you have to get that conveyor completely cleared out. The other downside with that is we'd have two conveyors running at all times. So it would actually be more wear and tear on conveyors. This setup, it's really the simplest possible setup. You have one straight conveyor from each silo. It's pretty straightforward as far as that goes. It looks not straight because everything comes in at an angle. So right now we're running corn silage out of one of the silos really close outside. All we have is this 18 foot conveyor running right now. Uh, rather than having a real big long conveyor outside and then another conveyor running, it was really a priority for us to have a separate conveyor for each ingredient. We thought it's gonna give us the best chance of being accurate. As long as you have good chains on them, they should be very reliable, which we learned pretty quickly with that one last week. But we got that replaced. All of the ingredients are loaded based on weight except for two of them. And that's these two small mineral bins that we have in here. So these actually are measured based on a pulse. So they're a flex auger, just like out of the big bins, except the difference is there's a sensor right here and it'll read every rotation of that auger. These have to be calibrated with the mineral that you're using. It'll know how much weight you're gonna get per rotation. So then it'll call for a certain amount of rotations versus a certain amount of pounds because some of these ingredients we're putting a very small amount in, little heifer batches. Last question is, are we gonna be putting robot milkers in at some point? We got the robot feeder, why not? Move on to the robot milker, or why did we do the feeder and not the milker first? I'm definitely very familiar with the Lely robot milkers. I've been on a lot more farms that have the robot milkers than the feeders, actually. It's definitely something that we've talked about and considered. Our situation's kind of unique, just the amount of young people that we have locally to help milk cows. We do milk three times a day, it takes about three hours per shift, and we need two people per shift, so that's quite a few shifts in a week. I'm only milking about four or five times myself. And then we have a full-time employee, Megan, that you see in a lot of the videos. She kind of manages different things with the parlor and young calves and cleans, does a lot of cleaning. And then we also hire a lot of young people that are high school age and a few adults part-time. We're definitely a lot more comfortable hiring young people to milk cows versus feeding. Just because with feeding, they have to be experienced with a skid loader and a tractor and loading all those ingredients, you can make very expensive mistakes pretty quickly. It's just a job where you need to have an adult that's mature and, and really trustworthy to be, actually be feeding cows. We did have some people that would help fill in with feeding sometimes, but it was mainly just me and my dad that would do the feeding. Milking obviously is very important too, but it is a job that's a little bit more doable for a young person that you're training. Uh, we have the future cow prep brushes in the parlor. That really helps make the cleaning consistent now too. Basically our situation with feeding was we kind of need to hire a full-time adult if we want to give my dad a break and have him do less feeding. We didn't really have the work to hire a full-time person. It's pretty hard to find somebody that's going to show up for two hours every morning to mix feed. You know the other option would have been I could start feeding a lot more and stop milking. I didn't really want to do that. I like milking. I like being able to see the cows every day or most days. You kind of do other jobs while you're milking. You know we're bedding stalls watching cows for sore feet or any other type of issue, checking the water troughs. That's the one thing with milking is you're actually with the cows, you're spending time with the cows, whereas feeding, it's really just a job where you're trying to do everything the same every time and be consistent. It really doesn't have anything to do with the cows other than the final product being run out into the troughs. Robot milkers would save a lot of man hours, but the thing is, the majority of those hours would just be part-time help and young people that were hiring. I really wouldn't want to let go of our full-time employee, Megan, just because we had robot milkers. I think that would be a mistake. I don't know that it would make my personal job a whole lot easier. I wouldn't have to 
worry about scheduling milkers every month and things like that, but I would have to worry about robot issues, so it would probably be an even trade-off there. The other thing is we do like to be able to provide work for young people from our church, family members, and uh, eventually my kids will be able to milk cows, hopefully. It's something that there's definitely challenges with it, but it's pretty satisfying to be able to provide some good, honest work for young people. My dad's always done a good job with uh, getting along with employees and and uh, working with them, and it's something that I'm trying to improve on a little bit. I kind of took over the hiring and the scheduling here in the last couple years. We have a very reliable crew. People show up to work. There's always the battles with protocol drift when you have people doing a job like that, but um, it's kind of on me to just be paying attention and making sure we're keeping everybody on the uh, straight and narrow with the different procedures we're supposed to do in the milking parlor. It's nice with our size herd, it only takes two and a half to three hours to milk. A young person can milk in the evening, 7.45 to 10.30, and still get to school the next day. It doesn't get too late. Just late enough. 10.30 is about as late as I want to have the milk and run. Yeah, and then morning and afternoon, Megan's milking during the week. I do some mornings, and on the weekends. Now with the feeding system, I'm milking one morning, Megan does the other morning, so it's either me or her here every morning. It's kind of nice. You know, and then as the milking's ending, we're always doing herd work, tying in cows in the headlocks. If we need to give shots or pills to any cows or anything, kind of all attaches to the milking, so... Even if I wasn't milking, I would still need to be out here. Still need to be taking care of the cows either way. So labor savings is a big part of both systems. We kind of felt like the feeding system gives you more other advantages besides the labor. Just the efficiency of them. We're going to be saving a lot of energy costs. Um, feed shrink savings. The potential increase in milk production. Feed efficiency from the cows with the consistent feeding. I think it would be different if I was milking twice a day myself, spending six hours in the parlor. I think robot milkers would be a no-brainer at that point. The way we're set up with part-time help and with Megan in the parlor, it just seems like that setup is working really well for us. I'm still yet to be convinced that you can go from milking 3X in a milking parlor to robots and not see a production drop. I know some people say you don't, or at least I don't think we'd see an increase for sure, just because every cow in this barn needs to be milked three times a day, regardless if they're 250 days of milk. They're still coming into the parlor, still making 60, 70, 80 pounds with decent components. Whereas I think a robot milker, those tail end cows, that's kind of where you get hurt a little bit because they stop going to the milker enough and then they're only making 40 pounds a day. I don't know. I will say we someday do want to do something with our milking parlor. The cow flow is not as good as it should be. It'd be really nice if cows could easily move in and out of the parlor. Uh, we kind of have to fight them a little bit just because of uh, the design of some things in there, which we can go over that in the future sometime. It's still been working pretty well for us. I definitely understand why there's more milking robots out there than feeding, just because there's more man hours going into milking every day than feeding. But yeah, depending on your situation, one like ours, I think the feeding system makes more sense. And I think the payback's gonna be quicker than a robot milker would be. Don't get me wrong, there's definitely some nice features with those robot milkers that that's yeah, definitely interested me before, but. Part of the problem too is I just actually enjoy milking cows. Just do a steady job like that. I actually enjoy it more than I did feeding. So yeah, it's gonna be a little harder to sell me on the robot milkers personally. Definitely let me know in the comments if you have more questions. I'm gonna try to get to a lot more details with this system as we're moving along and learning things. So I guess the last question I see a lot is how could we afford this as a small dairy farm? We took out some uh, debt to pay for all this. Um, Try to cash flow some, but definitely not all of it. We calculated it out that the system should pay for itself in time. The feeders themselves have a little quicker payback than the silos, those structures. You wouldn't expect to pay for themselves too quickly, but they kind of maximize the feeders. We felt good about doing it all in one shot like this. Don't regret it so far. So the way I look at it, feed cost is the biggest cost we have on a dairy farm. And what this system is doing is giving us the best control the best accuracy of mix, reducing shrink as much as possible in all these ingredients. And it's, it's gonna just help us be able to maximize and reduce our feed costs, I think, in the long term. Uh, you got a lot of upfront costs, but in the world of business, the cost of this setup is really not too crazy. We're a pretty small business, but spent less than a million dollars to build all this stuff. I wanna dig into the numbers more in the future. I'd like to actually get some hard numbers on cost savings before we start to look into that a little bit but I think it'd be helpful just to know the real numbers and and see what we're expecting the payback to be or to see what we actually are getting for a payback within the next year. 
Generally, in the past, our family does not spend money lightly. My dad and uncle were very frugal, wise spenders, and then I'm coming in here and uh, pushing for stuff like this, but I do think we're gonna get a payback and we're gonna be happy we did it. My dad's happy so far, so I think, uh, I think it's gonna work out. I'm not gonna say every 200 cal dairy should spend the money we did on this stuff, but I wanna try to prove that it can work and that it was a good decision. All right, thanks a lot for watching, guys.